an old master called Goso. And one of his students came to him one day and said, um, how am I getting on in my study of Zen? Oh, he said, you're all right, but you have a trivial fault. Well, what's that? You've altogether too much Zen. Well, said the student, if one is studying Zen, isn't it the most natural thing in the world to be talking about it? And the master replied, but when it's like an ordinary everyday conversation, it's somewhat better. Now this may appear at first sight to be a kind of Philistinism. If, in other words, the most spiritual discourse that one can have is, good morning, how do you do, nice day, isn't it? Does that not reduce all the great speculations of the human intellect, the great quests of human intelligence, to mere prosaic everyday matters? Well, it depends. You know, extremes often have a deceptive resemblance between each other. Very often, parallels have been drawn between the wisest of men and idiots, or between great sages and children, or between saints and drunkards. For in rather the same way that the highest and the lowest notes of the musical scale are alike inaudible, and yet extremely different, so in a somewhat similar way, the person who's been through the whole thing, the whole quest of wisdom, the whole study of philosopher, ends up deceptively like a stupid man who never heard of philosophy in his life. You know the Zen saying, when I knew nothing of Buddhism, Mountains were mountains and waters were waters. But when I had studied it a great deal, mountains were no longer mountains and waters were no longer waters. But when I had thoroughly understood the whole thing and arrived at the abode of peace, mountains were once again mountains and waters once again waters. Something rather similar happens here because you see, what Wittgenstein is really saying is that there is no problem of life in the sense in which we ordinarily use that phrase. And that seems an almost astounding affront to our common sense. Life not a problem. We see it as nothing but problems. We regard ourselves in a morning, noon and night struggle to solve the great problem of existence. And for some people this problem is... Uh, why does the universe exist? For other people, the problem is, how am I going to get enough to eat? And therefore, when you take it at one extreme or the other, why does the universe exist or how am I going to get enough to eat? Who can say that life is not a problem? And yet here is this audacious suggestion that what we are bothering about is a ghost. It's something that isn't really there. But you know, when we look at the history of science, we find to what an extraordinary sense science has solved problems by dissolving them. I mean, such things, for example, people have spent years and years and years, hours and hours of thought, trying to invent a mechanical contraption that would be in perpetual motion. Think of the trouble they would save themselves if they'd realized it can't be done. Or they've tried to find a construction for trisecting an angle with a straight edge and compass. And it can't be done. And now it's been proved that it can't be done. And how much trouble would have been saved. Or think again of trying to square the circle. Or imagine, for example, people thinking for centuries that the planets revolved about the Earth because they were encased in crystalline spheres. Now, the funny thing is they knew they were encased in crystalline spheres. Why? You could see right through them. And yet that the whole problem of how the spheres were moved, how there was a primum mobile, an outmost sphere that gave rotation to all the others, has simply disappeared. The spheres uh, are presumed now not to be there at all. And it's much easier to think of the solar system without the spheres. In the same way, people jolly well knew that the planets revolved about the Earth in, in circles, perfect circles. And it was a considerable shock when Kepler proved that the orbit of Mars was an ellipse. 
So too, we knew, we were perfectly sure for centuries, that light propagated itself through a mysterious continuum called the ether. And to our astonishment, we found out that there isn't any ether. In so many ways, just ordinary physical science, you see, is an act of understanding the world more clearly by ceasing to ask misleading questions. And exactly the same sort of thing happens, too, in psychotherapy. One of the characteristics of neurotic behavior, you know, is it's repetitive. The neurotic personality keeps going through unsuccessful life patterns again and again and again and nothing seems to be able to stop it. Now this kind of behavior is exactly what a Buddhist would mean by sangsara, the round or the rat race of birth and death, that is to say, of life as we ordinarily live it. Because it is around, it is a vicious circle for the reason that we keep trying to solve problems that are not simply overwhelmingly difficult, but problems that are not problems at all. They only look like problems. And so when we tackle, you see, impossible questions, uh, I mean, for a simple example, uh, if you really think it means something to ask why is a mouse when it spins and then try and find out, it'll never make any sense till the cows come home. Uh, in the same way, uh, Buddhist imagery likened this to looking for the horns of a hare or the child of a barren woman or the beard of a eunuch. And thus... Things go round and round and never come out when the question being asked is, the, is an absurd question, is a nonsense question. And therefore, what brings cure, healing, say, to a neurotic personality is the insight that the problem that he was trying to solve was no real problem at all. Now, take, for example some of the many ghosts which haunt our minds. We say, for example, that we all have an instinct to survive. And a lot of people thus treat the problem of life as, how am I to survive? And uh, one might almost be a little cautious about relieving people of this problem, lest they should lose the impetus to go on doing their work. But that also, impetus to go on doing your work, is another ghost. We think we are driven, you see. We think that what we do has these mysterious things behind it. Like, for example, people say, uh, we always choose, make our decisions on the basis of a pleasure principle. We always choose in accordance with what we prefer. And, of course, when our choice is limited to alternatives, all of which are rather unpleasant, we choose the lesser evil. Now, what does this actually say? We always choose what we prefer is simply another way of saying we always choose what we choose. For there is no way of showing what it is that we prefer except in the fact that we choose it. See, it's very important simply to keep your eye on what is being done and to describe that. And if you describe it clearly enough and well enough, you will probably find that the ghost of instinct uh, disappeared. Thus, you see, when we talk about an instinct for survival, uh, what is this saying? How, what is the evidence for the fact that there is an instinct for survival? There is no evidence except that, in, in fact, people survive until they don't. And this is rather odd because what happens to the instinct for survival when people don't survive? Well, Freud thought he solved this problem by inventing a death wish, a death instinct. But that too is something as phony as the survival instinct. 
And the whole problem is much more simply described if we get rid of both of these ghosts. So, in this way, we find that when we try to explain some kind of behavior, some kind of activity, by supposing that there is a motivating force, a sort of incarnate spook behind the whole thing, what has really happened is that we haven't described what's going on sufficiently clearly. Now this comes out in another way. When we try to describe anything at all and think that we are describing something that, as it were, exists all by itself, like uh, the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland whose face just hung all by itself in mid-air. I mean, supposing we have, uh, we draw the Cheshire Cat and uh, here he is with his big grin and uh, we try to describe what goes on here. What is this figure? Well, we get at first sidetracked. We are fascinated by the figure. Our attention is riveted upon it, and we think that that is what we are talking about, all by itself, just up there. And we start to talk about its outline, that it's um, black, and that uh, the cat has a uh, little wiggly fur on the top of its head, that it has whiskers and uh, a big grin, and so on and so forth. But I ask you, let's account for the fact that it's there. I mean, it isn't hanging in the middle of empty space. How does it happen that this black outline is there? Well, where is it? And then we have to say, well, it is on a piece of paper. And uh, the piece of paper is so attached to a framework that it stays upright and could be drawn on and is sufficiently firm. And furthermore, it is of such a texture that the ink doesn't just roll off when you put it there. And, uh, but you see what's beginning to happen is that I'm beginning to describe not simply the figure, but the ground of the figure, the environment of the figure. I should also go on to say that the figure got there through the application of a brush with ink on it. And how did the brush get there? Well, you might say, I put it there. Yes, but let's describe that more carefully. What do you mean, I put it there? What does this I word refer to? Well, I is a human organism. And um, it does things. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this it does things? Describe that more carefully. And what are you going to describe? You're going to describe the organism, aren't you? With all its complex structures. But as you describe those structures, as you describe that organism accurately, you are going to describe another action. You will describe the whole thing in terms of process. You won't find, as it were, some thing doing the process. As I've often said, we are so bugged by the notion of stuff, you see, stuff acting, stuff doing things. But all that is, you see, is that the world strikes us as being material until we examine it closely. In other words, a distant nebula in the heavens looks like a solid star until you turn a giant telescope on it and you make out the clear pattern of a spiral nebula. Or to the naked eye, a lump of wood looks like a solid and impenetrable mass of continuous matter. But when you start turning powerful microscopes on it and the instruments of nuclear physics, you begin to find out that this apparently solid lump of wood is a whirring mass of electrical charges going on in relatively enormous spaces. 
In other words, the concept of stuff is a sensation that we get when we haven't examined things sufficiently closely or when our instruments are not fine enough to penetrate what we're observing. But when the instruments are fine enough, what we get instead is pattern, and pattern is simply a form of behavior, of activity. Consider this in another way. Let's go back to the human organism and ask the question, well, what about its shape? How is it that a human organism is contained? All the organs are kept in by the skin. Well, we will describe, of course, the structure of skin and how it is that it holds together. But then we'll soon find out that we're also talking about the surrounding air, which impinges upon the human skin with a pressure of about 15 pounds per square inch, so that if it weren't there, we'd explode. Now, so the question arises, uh, you know, what is keeping the organism in shape? And we find out that it is not only what is going on inside the skin that keeps it in shape, but also what's going on outside the skin. And when we go on to describe this still more carefully, we discover that it isn't quite correct to say that it is the air that is doing this or that it is the organism that is doing this. We begin to describe instead what uh, Dewey and Bentley in their very fascinating book, Knowing and the Known, call a transaction. Now that is to say, a buyer can't buy unless somebody is also selling. You can't know anything unless there's something to know. You can't eat unless there's something to be eaten. And this fact, you see, is constantly overlooked, that anything in the world, whether it's inanimate or animate, whatever it may be, is there by virtue of being in a transactional relationship, not with something else, but with everything else. In other words, a human being, of course, has ever so many relationships. They're very complicated. And because a person, say, we call a doctor, is not only related to his actual work of doctoring, but he may be also a father related to a family, he's a citizen related to a community in other ways than as the doctor, and so on and so forth. And so we begin to imagine him, as it were, apart from his relationships, as a sort of constant, going through all these different relationships, and therefore in some way different from them all. But this, you see, creates a ghost. It creates a being independent of all the different relationships in which he finds himself. When, as strictly speaking, he is inseparable from those relationships. And we can't eliminate them. We can only describe him fully as the entire whole complex. So that, in other words, Every organism could be called the behavior of the field or environment in which it is found. Now, this doesn't mean, on the one hand, that the organism is something pushed around by the environment and is completely passive and inert, and that everything that it does is simply a response to external stimulus. Because, in a way... The organism is part of its environment. After all, it is an object, a process in nature, in the cosmos, just as much as everything in its environment. There is really no way of separating the two and saying that one acts upon the other. 
that the organism, as it were, shoves around the environment or that the environment shoves around the organism. Instead of speaking, as it were, in this terminology of doers and done-tos, of attackers and victims, we simplify things considerably just by confining ourselves to a description of what is happening. And as we do this, we get a peculiarly clarified picture of the world without all sorts of ghosts. And it is in this way that we also begin to be able to have some preliminary intuition or sensation of the meaning of the fact that life is not a problem. In other words, not a contest between ourselves and our environment. This conception of life turns out to be basically phony.